Well, aren't you grateful that we have a great God? Amen. If you would open your Bibles today to the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to study together this morning these verses 11 through 21. I want to speak to you today on this subject, the moment we've all been waiting for. I don't know if you've been waiting for it, but I've been waiting for it. I've been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting for this, uh, this Sunday when we would come to these verses of Scripture because they deal with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there is, there is something, a facial expression that is common among all people regardless of the country, the culture or the continent from which we come. It's a facial expression. It's common to all of us. And it happens when we are surprised by something. When something takes us by surprise. It really has a technical term. I didn't know it until I studied it this week. It's called the surprise eyebrow. Now what it is is when you are surprised by something, when you are shocked by something, the eyebrow will raise. The eyes will come wide open, allowing all the light possible to come in so you can focus clearly on what you saw. Sometimes we'll even do what's called a double take. In other words, we look back to make sure that we really saw what we think we saw. And even attached to that surprise eyebrow is the dropping of the jaw. I ever experienced something that surprised you so much your eyebrows raised, your eyes got bigger and your mouth fell open? I got to thinking about that this week and I also got to discovering that there are what I call some now surprise eyebrow moments in the Bible. Don't you know it was a surprise eyebrow moment for Moses when he saw that bush burning, but it was not burning up. It caught his attention and he came aside. I, I, I'd love to have been there to see the eyebrows rise and the jaw drop. Don't you know it was a surprise eyebrow moment for the people of God when they found themselves trapped between the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them and then God did the miraculous and impossible and parted the waters of the Red Sea, don't you know somebody in that crowd raised their eyebrows at that? I know it was a surprise eyebrow moment the day Balaam's donkey talked. Don't y'all know that? And I think it was a surprised eyebrow moment the day Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth, and lo and behold, there's movement down in the tomb. Wouldn't you love to have seen Mary and Martha when Lazarus came walking out? Well, I mention all of those things to say this. Take all of the surprise eyebrow moments of all history, put them all together, and they are nothing compared to the day Jesus Christ comes, that moment that we all have been waiting for. I'll tell you, a world is going to drop its jaw, and eyes are going to widen, and double takes are going to occur making sure that they see what they think they see and it will be indeed what they see, Jesus Christ coming again. You know, the thought that God gave me as I studied this text this week was simply this. One day, the curtain of time will be pulled back and the Lord Jesus will return. It's the moment that we have all been waiting for and it's that moment that John saw and gives us details about in Revelation 19 
11 through 21. These verses divide into three easy sections. And I want you to notice these sections as we study them together today and as we think about that moment, one of these days, that we all desire to see when Jesus Christ literally returns all the way, places His feet on this earth, and rules and reigns over this world. There are three things I want you to notice in these verses. First of all, in verses 11, 12, 13, and then down at verse 16, I want you to notice the anticipated appearing of the Lord. The anticipated appearing of the Lord. You'll notice in verse 11 that John begins this text by saying, Now I saw. And what he's saying is this. I really saw it. John's just letting you know that what I'm about to describe for you, what I'm about to tell you, it, it's, it, I, it, it's not a dream that I had. It's not a figment of my imagination. No, it's something that I literally saw. I actually saw this happening. And then John says, not only did I see it, but I want you to see it because he uses the next word, behold. You notice he said, I saw heaven open and behold. And that word is for us. He wants us to get a glimpse of this anticipated appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The most anticipated event in all of human history for people of God is the rapture and the return, ladies and gentlemen, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in these verses of Scripture, John describes that anticipated appearing of Jesus. And I want you to notice two things about it. I want you to notice that first of all, he talks about his powerful nature. His powerful nature. Notice what John uh, says about the one that is coming in verse 11. He says, I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Here is one coming on a white horse. Now don't confuse him with the one who's already come. In Revelation, remember, there is one co who comes on a white horse. He is, the, he is the Antichrist. Back in chapter 6, we saw him coming. He's got a bow but no arrows, remember, and he comes to conquer. But there are two different riders. Satan always has desired to be an imitator and, and has always wanted to be like God and be God. But this rider is none other, ladies and gentlemen, than the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the description of him, his powerful nature. He's called faithful and true. Boy, aren't you glad that our Jesus is faithful and he is true. He is the true one. And when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, He's telling the truth because He is the truth. He is true. But not only is He true, He's faithful. That means you can depend on Jesus Christ this morning, folks. You may not can depend on other people. Some people may let you down. But I got news for you. Jesus won't let you down. He is faithful and He is true. His promises are true and He'll be faithful to those promises. You say, well, it hadn't come true yet. You just hold on to it. You just hold on to it. You just mark it down and hold on to it before it's over. It'll become true because God must be true to His Word. He's faithful and true. You can depend on on Jesus. His powerful nature. Notice that He is going to come in righteousness. Did you notice that in verse number 11? He is faithful and true and in righteousness He comes. He comes in righteousness to judge and to make war. You see, when the Lord Jesus returns physically to this earth, when He makes that return, it will be different from the first time Jesus came. The first time Jesus came into this world, He came to redeem. But when He comes this time, He's coming to rule. The first time He came, 
He came as the suffering servant. But when He comes this time, He will come as the supreme sovereign. The first time He came, He came as a mediator between man and God. But the second time He comes, He's coming as the master over all. The first time He came, He was cursed as the false king, but the second time He comes, He'll be crowned as the true king of kings and lord of lords. He's going to come, return physically to this earth. Heaven opened up, John said, and I saw this one coming. I saw his powerful nature. But not only notice his powerful nature, but his personal name. Notice that in verse number 12, John says, His eyes were like a flame of fire. That means discernment and sight. And on his head were many crowns. Oh, when Jesus comes again, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to be crowned. And the word crown here is the word diadem. It's the king's crown. Because this truly is the real King of kings and Lord of lords. I thought about it when Jesus came the first time. They mistreated and abused Him. When Jesus came the first time, they didn't honor His royal head, did they? They took a crown of thorns and they pressed that crown of thorns upon the beautiful head of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when Jesus comes the second time down into this earth, there will be no crown of thorns. There will be a diadem of crowns around His head as Jesus rules and reigns on this earth. His powerful nature, His personal name. Notice that it says, He had a name written that no one knew except Himself. I call that His secret name. Don't you think that would be an appropriate title? It says he knows it, but it says you don't know it. I'm always amazed at these writers who try to write something that's not there. You ever notice that? Sometimes writers try to write something that's not there. Well, to comment on this very much is to write something that's not there because you don't know it, do you? If you don't know it, how can you write about it? But you know, the more I thought about it, the wonder of it is, is that our God is so awesome, so amazing so big, so great, that no word, no one word, no one name can describe Him. He has a secret name. But then He has a special name. Notice as John goes on, He said, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God. We know that's true. John said in chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Somewhere in your Bible margin, you just ought to write out, that's Jesus. That's Jesus right there. How do I know that? I know it because in verse 14 it says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. That's Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. And here is the Word of God appearing again in Scripture, appearing at the end of the ages. The Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. The power of His Word. We're going to talk about that in just a few moments. There is power in the Word of God. You understand that? There is power in God's Word. There is power for victory in God's Word. He has a secret name. He has a special name. He has a sovereign name. Look down at verse 16. It says, And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. And here is that name. King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible has already told us in Philippians. It told us that one of these days every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that what? That Jesus is is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Hey, He's coming back. You know, they put an inscription over the cross that says that He's King of the Jews. Oh no, that's wrong. He was King of the Jews, but He's not just King of the Jews, ladies and gentlemen. He's King of the whole world. He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and on Him is written a sovereign name that the world will bow before. 
the anticipated appearing of the Lord's coming. But I want you to notice in these verses, not only the anticipated appearing of the Lord, I want you to notice in verses 14 and 15, the accumulated armies of the Lord. Notice these accumulated armies. They're getting together. They're gathering together. Verse 14 says, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The gathering of the armies. I want you to notice the gathering of these armies. They're all coming together. The armies in heaven are coming forward. They are following him. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Well, who, who composed the armies of heaven? Who's in this gathering, this grouping of armies that are coming out of heaven? Well, there are two groups mentioned. If you study all the Bible has to say, one group is mentioned in this text, but there are two groups mentioned. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. Go and read that passage this afternoon. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. It says in that passage that when the Lord Jesus does come, that He is coming with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who believe not the gospel and have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. So guess what's coming out of heaven when the armies come? The angels are coming. Oh, imagine what a sight that's going to be one of these days when the angels of heaven gather together around the King of kings and Lord of lords. And a lot of times when we think about angels, we think about these, these sweet little creatures. But angels are powerful forces, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, my Bible tells me that one angel took care of 185,000 on a night. Just one night. One angel. Jesus said on the cross that he could have called 12 legions of angels. Could you imagine one of these days, the armies of heaven, they're coming out of glory and the angels have gathered around the king of kings. But oh, not only are the angels in this group, there's another group that's mentioned in the armies of heaven. And John talks about it in this passage of Scripture here in Revelation 19 verse 14 when he said, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed on white horses. Well, who are they? Oh, well, just go back to the marriage supper of the Lamb. What were the people at the marriage supper of the Lamb clothed with? fine linen, bright and white. Hey, the church is gathered together with the angels. Isn't that going to be something? I'll tell you, that's a brow, wide open, jaw-dropping moment right there. And here the, Amy, the armies of, of, of heaven are going to come and they're going to be on, riding on white horses. Hey, if you don't know how to ride a horse in retirement, I'm going to be start giving lessons, getting folks ready. Amen? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't think you'll need a lesson. I think you'll be able to come back riding. Here we are, the armies of God. And here we, here we come back with Him. We follow Him. Did you notice that? I circled that word in my Bible in verse 14, that these armies of heaven follow Him. And I thought, well, now that's a little interesting uh, military tactic. Because normally, when the battle is raging, the general is back at the headquarters operating things from there. But in this battle, the general isn't back at headquarters. He's come out of headquarters. He's leading the army into the fight. I want you to notice not only the gathering of the armies, but the going of the army. You'll notice that verse 14 says they followed him on white horses. Verse 15 says now out of his mouth 
goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Notice the going of the armies. And there are three things I want you to notice. First of all, I want you to notice the warfare of the armies. And yes, it's singular, warfare. Today we think about warfare, we think about weapons. Notice the weapon. Notice the weapon. Because when we think about armies, we think about all the weapons that are used. We think about all this smart technology today. And yes, we can pinpoint bombs and drop them. And we have tanks that shoot fire and all kinds of things. And guess what? The nations will be gathered together one of these days. Over there in the promised land, they'll be gathered up against the nation of Israel. They'll be gathered against God. In fact, this text says that they'll come out to fight against Him who comes on the white horse. They'll have the audacity to think, that they can go up against the king of kings and win. You know, I was just looking at this text this week. I try to live in every text every week. And you notice that the weapon is his word. You notice that? Verse 15 says, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it it should strike the nations. What, what's the weapon? It's His Word. He just speaks the Word. How long will it take for this battle to be done? You know, I told Andy this week I was chatting with him and I told him I will never forget this having been chaplain at Greenville High School for about 15 years. I remember we made it into the playoffs that year. And I don't know if it was first or second round, but we were playing Viger out of Mobile. And Viger's usually always pretty good, but they were more than pretty good that year. They were really good. In fact, they had Division I football players that went on to play in various places all over the country on both sides of the ball. And I remember Coach McClendon and I walking across the field to meet the coach at Viger. Coach McClendon was a little apologetic because... Uh, working on some facilities and things there in, 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 in the stadium and, and he'd had to try to make arrangements for them, the place to get dressed and that kind of thing. And when they pulled in, they just pulled in down there on the other end of the field and, and uh, had them already dressed when they drove up. And, and Coach McClendon was apologizing for it and I'll never forget it. He looked at Coach McClendon and he said, well, Coach, don't worry about it. We ain't going to be here long no how. Man, Coach McClendon, when we walked back across the field, said, what do you think that means? I said, I think that means you better pull out your best pregame, halftime, and any kind of thing you got and give it to them. And you know what? It didn't last long. It didn't last long, and it was over, about 40-something to nothing by the time the clock ended that night. Well, I got news for you. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes and speaks that word, it isn't going to take long, ladies and gentlemen, for the word of God to achieve its accomplished goal and the devil and the demons of hell and all those who stand with him will be done with the weapon. You notice the way. He'll rule with a rod of iron. Did you notice that? That means his law will forever be law and it will forever be true and it will forever be upheld. And, and then notice the wrath. He says he will, he will tread the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath. He'll, he'll crush the enemies just like they would crush the grapes in the winepress. There, there he gives you just a little inkling of what's coming and the accumulated armies of the Lord. The last thing that I want you to notice in verses 17 through 21 is the annihilating attack. Because when God comes, as He's already described, He'll literally annihilate the nations of the world. And he talks about it in verses 17 and, and following all the way down to verse 21. I want you to notice in verse 17 the angelic announcement. Notice what he says. He said, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together, and I circle these this for the supper of the great God. 
There are two suppers now. Oh, did you notice it? There are two suppers now. We've already talked about one supper. And that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. But there's another supper mentioned in the Bible. You see, the first supper is the supper of joy. But the second supper is the supper of judgment. The first supper is the supper of celebration. But the second supper is a supper of crying. Notice, he gives an invitation, the angel does, to what? The birds of the air. Oh, I just sat back this, morning, this, this week and I was listening and I read this text again this morning. You can almost hear the flopping of the wings as the fowls of the air come. See, this is, a, this is a feast for the fowl. This is a banquet for the birds that's coming. The supper of the great God when those who come against Him will lay slain on the battlefield. You know how I got to thinking about it? You can either, and this, this gets plain, but it, it needs, you can either be a guest at one supper or you can be the meal at the other. You just decide which you want to be. You can be the guest and sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb, be served by Him, or you can become the meal for the birds of the air. The angelic announcement, and then the astonishing assessment. These uh, verses continue with verses 19 and following, they continue with, uh, he saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse. And notice what happens in verse 20. He just, he just, he captures the beast, he captures the false prophet, and he just cast them into the lake of fire. And there they'll burn for all eternity. See, it's not going to take long. And it'll all be over. You know, the question is what should our attitude be? What, what, what does this mean for us today? What should our attitude be? And I, I put in your notes, I put four attitudes toward His coming. Now, I want to just touch them quickly for just a moment. Four attitudes. Four attitudes we should have regarding the return, the literal physical return of Jesus back to the earth. First of all, we should learn about His return. Jesus told us about it in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, when He ascended back to heaven and uh, those uh, angels were standing there and they told the disciples then and they tell us today, why stand gazing? This same Jesus whom you've seen go in like manner, He's coming back. So that just means to me that they saw Him go God's people are going to see Him come. We need to learn about it. But more than just learn about His coming, we need to look for His coming. Listen to what Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says. It says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to look for His coming. Are, are you looking for it? Did you, did you think about it this morning? No, I think we have a world that wakes up not even thinking about it. This might be the day. We ought to learn about His coming. We ought to look for His coming. We ought to, we ought to long for His coming. The last prayer in the Bible, we'll talk about it in a few weeks to come. In Revelation 22 and verse 20 it says, Even so come, Lord Jesus. That's a longing in the heart of uh, the people of God then and it should be a longing in our hearts today we ought to learn about His coming we ought to look for His coming we ought to long for His coming and then most important we should live for His coming I love Luke 19, 13 I hope you go read about it I, I, I love Luke 19, 13 and Luke 19, 13 in the old King James language and I like that one it, it says occupy till I come now, the new King James says, do business till I come. Occupy till I come. See, that has to do with my living. It has to do with my everyday activity as a child of God. John Quartz was uh, uh, part of the uh, Billy Graham evangelism team. And he told this story. He said when he was a, when he was a young boy that every, every year at certain times they would go to granddaddy's. 
And he said, uh, you know, all the family would be there and there would be six to eight to ten cousins there and, and they'd, go to, they'd go to granddad's. And he said one day they, they got up and they had a wonderful breakfast and all of them were saying, granddad, we want to go to the field. We want to go to the field. And they just kept bugging him. And, and, and he said to his son, John, he said, okay, John, he said, take them to the field. He said, but John... He said, don't bring them back until the end of the day. But you take them to the field. Oh, they got on the wagon. And they were all excited and they were all happy and they got in the field. And uh, they, were, they were pitchforking hay and they were working in the field for about an hour. It all was good. And after about an hour and some of that hay got down their, their shirt and got down their back and they started itching and the sun got up and it started. they started baking then they started saying to John, take us home. And John said, no, we can't go home. We're going to stay to the end of the day. So they work on a little while more. And then they, John, please take us home. It's just too hot. Take us home. But no, all day long they stayed. Until about 5 o'clock and John took them home. That night at the supper table. Granddaddy got them all gathered around the table. And he said, now I want to talk to you. A little bit. He said, you look around the farm here and you think, well, God's really blessed us and He had. And we give God all the credit and all the glory for everything we have. But he said, my dear grandchildren, the reason God has blessed us like He has is because He taught us not to be afraid of hard work and stay in the field. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, I don't know when all this is going to start. I don't know when it's all going to wrap itself up. But what I do know is my Lord has said to me, Occupy until I come. And what I want to do is I want to still be in the field. I want to still be laboring for the Lord. I want to still be living my life for His honor and glory until He does bust the sky to say, Come on up and be with me, and all this begins. Hey, Olive Branch has been here for a long time. You know why? Because somebody stayed in the field, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody stayed in the field. And we got to be faithful as the people of God to stay in the field, to work the harvest, so that we can continue to reap the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. A wonderful fellowship. Would you bow together with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your holy word. And we thank you so much for the truth of it. We thank you that you are the one faithful and true. And we can count on your words and your truth. Thank you that there is a moment that in our hearts we all long for. That moment when you will visibly return to the earth, but not for us because we're coming with you we'll be a part of the armies of heaven that come back in victorious glory. Lord, thank you for saving us. And for those who've never trusted you and come to you as Lord and Savior, may today be that moment is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.